I often get asked, Sabado, what are some of the habits that you had early on that helped you find financial independence at 51? I'm going to share with you 15 habits that I followed, almost tried and true for the last 20 years that put me in a position to be able to find financial independence and retire early. So let's get into it. Um, Number one, I buy clothes for comfort, uh, not for brand or price. I don't try to find the name brands that look good and that everybody's wearing. I don't want to be like everybody else. I want clothes that fit that are comfortable. One time my wife and I were at a restaurant and we saw some ladies standing in the corner and they kept leaning from foot to foot. And I said, why do they keep swaying back and forth? My wife said, because those shoes are uncomfortable. And I remember when I was a kid and I tried to buy some Converse All-Stars. I thought they were the cool shoes, the Chuck Taylors. And I remember the bottoms felt like my feet were on the ground. It didn't feel good. And so from that point on, I told myself, I'm not going to try to buy clothes to fit in because fitting in is uncomfortable. These ladies at the restaurant were uncomfortable. And if clothes aren't comfortable, then you shouldn't wear them. Does that mean you have to go out and buy all the cheap stuff? No, I'm not saying that everything I buy is cheap, but it fits well. It lasts a long time. It's of good quality. And it's not about the brand. And it's not trying to show people who I am by the quality of clothes or the cost of the clothes that I buy. Number two, uh, this is the fourth home that I've owned. And in each of the homes that I've owned, it was always critical to me that I was able to afford the homes that I bought. And I have friends of mine right now that are paying double what I'm paying for a mortgage because they wanted the big house in the nice area with the good schools and all of that. But the fact of the matter is they couldn't afford it. And the only reason they bought those houses was because they wanted to prove to everybody else that they had made it because they had the big house. And the funny part about it is that people with money generally will not go out and spend top dollar for anything because they want to make sure that their money's working for them. Um, So I've always bought houses that were modest, that fit my needs, that gave me the space that I wanted. And as I've bought and sold houses, I've been able to move to a nicer and nicer place. But it's not because of any other reason, except I want to live in a place that's comfortable for me, that meets my needs, that has the space that I have and allows me to do the things that I need to do in my space, but certainly not because of the impression that other people have, because I'm sure there are some people that would look at my house now and say, why do you live there? But to me, it's comfortable and I love it. Number three, I'd never allowed myself to get caught up into the next gadget. There was a period of time when you wanted to upgrade your cell phone, you wanted to upgrade your iPhone, you wanted to upgrade, I don't know, your Motorola, whatever it was. And the way that you upgraded your phone is every couple of years, you would get, the phone would come out, the cell phone company would give you a deal, and if you went with their deal, they'd give you a free cell phone. Well, folks, that's just not the case anymore. These iPhones and these uh, Samsung phones and all these phones, These things are costing major dollars, up to a thousand dollars and more, and they come out every three or four months. And so imagine saying, I want to put myself in a position to find financial independence, but I'm going to spend $3,500 a year on something that the battery is going to die in a couple months in any way and have to upgrade. So it, it just doesn't make sense. Um, And there's a lot of gadgets out there. You've got the TVs that are the QLEDs. So why get rid of a good LED TV for a QLED when your LED TV is only four or five years old? So I stopped going after the new gadget because what I was finding is people that were going after the new gadget, they were putting those things on credit cards because they couldn't afford them, which we're going to talk about in a minute. But They were putting that stuff on credit cards. They were spending a bunch of money. But the fact is they didn't have money to put away. And my thing was I always wanted to make sure I had money to put away. And I just couldn't keep up with the flow of of the new technology and the new gadgets. Uh, It's just too expensive. Number four, um, I avoid going into debt for instant gratification. There are only a few things that I will buy on debt. One of those is a house because a debt on a house is actually an investment because houses go up over time and increase in value. 
I'm not going to go in debt for a car. I'm not going to go in debt, certainly to buy some clothes or some shoes or to buy an iPhone or something like that. I never finance anything. In fact, one of the only reasons that people finance things, and again, I, I, like I say, those of you that have been rocking with me for a while know I keep it real. The only reason that people finance things is because they can't afford them. If you can afford them, you don't finance them. But if you can't afford them and you want them because you want to show other people what you have, well, guess what? Now you go out and you get a credit card. And sure, you might be able to do balance transfers and stuff like that, but there's only a, a period of time that that's gonna, you could keep up with that. Um, or you could go out and they'll say, 90 days, same as cash. Well, on that 91st day, you're still paying the interest for that first 90 days plus the interest going forward. Why? Because if you couldn't afford it now or then, you can't afford it now. And then you start making payments. Then you get into the minimum payment cycle. And think about it. The average American has a couple thousands of dollars in credit card debt. Why? Because they buy things they can't afford. And why would we buy something that we can't afford? To impress other people. And the fact of the matter is, are you really impressing that person? Because that person is in the same boat you are. Now that person is going to try to outdo you and then go in debt. So I don't do that. I take that money. I don't use things that have interest charges. I don't do, um, what is it, banking fees. People go to ATMs to get money out of out of network ATMs and spend $5, $10 on out of network fees. I just don't do it. If I don't have the cash in my pocket and that my bank isn't around, then guess what? I'm just not going to have any cash in my pocket. So instant gratification, folks, is costing us money. It's costing you money. And if you take all of that, what you're doing is you're nickel and diming yourself to death because that same money could be growing in an interest, but instead you're giving it to somebody for the convenience. So you're paying $20 on every $100 for the convenience of having the money today as opposed to waiting somewhere down the road. Instant gratification is really hurting a lot of us. Number five, I eat regular food. Do I go to a restaurant from time to time? Sure I do. Do I go often? No. Was there a time I went more than before? Sure. But I try to just eat regular food. I try to eat healthy food and I prepare most of my own food because I know what it is that I'm getting. And that's for a couple of reasons. Number one, if you go to most restaurants and you look at what they put in the food to make it taste the way that it tastes, it's usually going to be high in sodium, it's going to be high in fats, it's going to be unhealthy. And so it's very rare that somebody who's in shape, that's in good shape or a good physique, is eating at restaurants every day. Sure, I, you know what, I, if, if you know somebody that is, leave it in the comments. I'm, I'm sure there's going to be somebody that says that they do. But generally, eating out isn't the healthiest way to eat. And so I like to prepare my own food. I like to uh, eat healthy, and what I find is, is if I go to a restaurant, my wife and I go to a restaurant, it's easily going to be a couple hundred bucks, but if I prepare my own food, I go to the grocery store, and I get two weeks worth of groceries for the same amount that would cost me for a meal at a nice restaurant, and so what do I do? I take that money and I put that money away. It, again, it goes back to stopping at Starbucks and that avocado toast and the thousands of dollars every year that you spend on eating out. You stop the eating out, now that's more money you can save. Are you going to be able to retire early because you stopped eating out? No. But if you stop eating out, you stop buying the Starbucks, you stop paying interest on those credit cards, you stop buying things you can't afford, you stop. So you start to see where this goes is you really start to find yourself in a place where instead of having nothing every month, you cut some of this leakage out or some of these nickels and dimes out. Now you're up to probably four or $500 a month and I've still got a bunch more to go. Number six, I focus on growing my money as opposed to spending it. A lot of us think about money in a different way. A lot of us think if we get a bonus or we get a raise or we get an increase or some extra money comes in, the first thing we think about is how do we spend that money? What can I go buy? Can I go buy that coach purse? Can I go buy those Fendi shoes? Can I go buy those Ferragamo slippers? Can I go buy this Rolex watch? Can I go buy this new car? Uh, can I pay this bill down so that way I can go out and buy some more stuff that I can't afford? What I've always done is I said, how can I take this money and have this money grow? So how do I pay myself first? If I get $100 of money, of, let's say extra money, I don't think there's a such thing as extra money, but if I have an extra, $100 of extra money, if, and I want to go buy something. Well, before I go buy that thing, let me take $20 of that. Uh, my goal was always to take at least 10 to 15% of every dollar that I got, and I put that away. 
And so if I get $100 extra, I take $20 of that. And now that $20 over the course of the next year might grow to $60, $70, $80. And I still had $60, $70, $80 to spend on whatever I needed to spend it on. But I'm always thinking about how can I grow my wealth? How can I grow my money as opposed to how can I spend my money? And I think the moment that you move away from being a consumer to being a grower, I think you find yourself in a completely different circumstance. It absolutely worked for me because now what I do is, I sure, I, do I do things that cost money? 100%. I do not live this super frugal, I'm going to stay at home all day lifestyle, but I'm always aware of the fact that any money that I get, I want to make sure I'm able to put a large proportion of that away so that way it grows and becomes something more in the future than it is today. Number seven. I stay away from get rich quick schemes. I've had people come to me and they've come to me with these ideas and these plans and these plots where you can make a bunch of money if you do this, you can make a bunch of money if you do that. And the reality is most of the time there's two things that are true there. Number one, the people that are coming to me with that are broke. And number two, the people that are coming to me with that are no better off even after they've done that. I remember one time I was playing basketball in a gym with a guy and there's this other guy that came to me and he says, hey, you could be part of this thing and we make a bunch of money, so on and so forth. And he says, let's go have lunch after we play basketball. So I go and have lunch with him because this is before I really understood what all this was about. And it was it turned out he was talking about a multi-level marketing scheme. I went with him, he drove, his car was an absolute beater, but he's telling me that I can get rich if I'm doing the stuff that he's doing. And that guy wasn't rich. And so if you look at rich people, you look at the Bill Gates, you look at the Jeff Bezos, you look at the Mark Zuckerberg, you look at people that have money, those people with money grew their money at a slow and steady pace, doing smart things with their money, buying assets, investing in assets, investing in stocks, putting money away, saving it, making good money decisions. It wasn't, here's Dr. X's magic elixir, And it's easy to say, well, they had a big company, so they got rich. Well, Jeff Bezos started Amazon in his garage. So when you start to think about how they got to where they were, it took them a period of time to get there. And anybody that's ever got anything that's worth it has taken time to get there. And I think the old adage goes, if it sounds too good to be true, it normally is. So I stay away from get-rich-quick schemes, no matter what they are or how good they sound. Stay away from seminars. There's a bunch of people that have these seminars where if you go to this seminar, you spend $79.99 and it teaches you how to get rich. Well, if you, it, it sounds good. And the person that's telling you these things might actually have a little bit of dough in their pocket. But did the person that is telling you this, did they get to that point because of what they sat through a seminar? Or did they get that money Because they have these seminars and then people like you and me go in there and we pay that money to do it at 80 bucks a pop. So people that have money, people that have been successful, they don't get successful from going to seminars to learn how to be successful. They become successful by doing the work. And I talk in another video about all the things that I had to go through in order to get to where I am today. And none of it was going to a seminar. Now, Are there times when you go to seminars to help yourself and to learn a new skill? 100%. But it's not about getting rich. It's about learning a new skill. It's about learning how to do something different. It's about enhancement and growing. Which brings me to number nine. I constantly am investing in myself. When I was working, I would go to uh, continuing education classes. There was a period of time where I said, I'm going to read a book a month. I'm always on YouTube trying to figure things out and looking for different sources of information. I'm constantly asking questions, putting myself in situations where there are things that I don't know so I can ask a question. But I'm constantly investing in myself, constantly trying to figure out new information, constantly with my financial advisor trying to understand how does finance work, um, what kind of investments are out there. And it doesn't all have to be classroom learning. There's opportunities for us to learn just about everywhere we go, but we have to make sure that we do that. And then sometimes it costs us money to invest in ourselves. Sometimes we have to pay somebody to do something else 
So that way it frees up the time for us to go and do what it is that we need to do. So for example, every couple of weeks we have somebody come in and do a deep cleaning of the house. Well, one of the things that's really important to us is that we do community service and we give back to the community. But if I'm spending all of my time cleaning up my house, then that takes away from the time that I could use to go out and help others. So investing in yourself takes a lot of different forms, but the danger is when you don't invest in yourself because then you lose the opportunity to learn something new, to do something new, to get yourself to where you wanna be. And I've always been about continuing education becoming better. I've always wanted to be better tomorrow than I am today. Number 10, helping others. Those of you that have paid attention to my story and that have been rocking with me for a while know that when I was in middle school, I was working with kids. When I was in high school, I was working with middle school kids to help them understand the dangers of drugs and smoking and also doing stuff with blood drives. When I got out of college, I was working with kids and all that, but my, my point is that I've always been in service for others. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, I just feel good because I think I have some inherent gifts that others benefit from. You think people benefit from this channel. Um, does everybody benefit? No, but I can't change everybody's perspective, but I can help some of you that wanna know with my perspective because I've been fortunate enough to retire at 51 and there's other people that have aspirations to retire and may not have somebody to ask about it, so here I am. But the idea is number one, I feel good doing that, and number two, and more importantly, I look at the world as this living system with everything being connected to everything else. And so if I'm putting out energy into the world of helping others, it may inspire others to help others, and that may inspire others to help others. So at some point, perhaps, and again, it's not, a, it's not a because of, but perhaps in a time where I might need some service to me, they would come back around because the universe is filled with people who are inspired to help each other. So I always spent a lot of time helping others. And, and that's come to be true where there were people that in my life I had the opportunity to influence. I did not know Number one, that I was influencing them. And number two, how I was influencing them. But then at some point, they found themselves wanting to help me in some very difficult times. And I found myself on the better side of some things that could have gone really wrong because of the universe coalescing around that idea. So I always spent time helping others. Number 11. I always made it a point to accept technological advances. As we age and as time goes on, the more and more technology becomes uh, intimidating to us because we don't understand it, we don't know it. Right now, there's the whole conversation about AI and we watch all of these movies and we think AI is gonna take over and, and you know it, it might. But there's also some plausible uses for it. So I could get caught into the idea that robots are gonna take us over and put us all in misery or I could say, let me take a look at how I can use this to help make my life better. Because for those of you that resisted computers back in the 90s, you're starting to realize that computers actually have made our lives easier. The reason that we're able to correspond and have these discussions is because of a computer. But if everybody said, no, I'm not gonna touch computers, then guess what? We wouldn't have this opportunity. And for some of us, we wouldn't feel like there's any hope because we wouldn't have, be able to correspond with anybody else that's in the space that we might wanna be in. So I've always embraced new technologies. Now, does that mean I just bring them all in with open arms without questions? No, but I try to understand, here's a new technology, and I liken that to new information. Here's some new information. How can I process that? Let me take it in, let me try to understand it to the degree that I can and figure out how I can use this to my benefit and to move me and my mission forward. And so what I've found is where I am today is largely due to the fact that I've been able to take in new technologies, take in new information and process those into a constructive way or constructive format that's helped me move forward. Number 12, I focus, I've always been an individual that focuses on experiences over money. And I know a lot of you are going to say, well, but money is really important. 
a mantra that I've always had is it's not what I'm doing, it's who I'm doing it with. Because at the end of the day, there will be a point in all of our lives where money is not that important. But what will be important is the story that we have to tell. And I, I've always told people that my goal is when I'm 90 years old, that I have a good story to tell. And I talk about my personal mission statement being to uplift the human condition. I want to be able to explain to people what I did at every point in my life, even some of the more difficult pieces of my life, how were those connected to me uplifting the human condition. But it doesn't come down to money. In fact, there have been a couple of times where when I started working, I went from working in an elementary school to being a recruiter, and I made a bunch of money as a recruiter, but then I took a step backwards um, and I took a significant step backwards to go into HR uh, because I wanted the stability that HR gave me. So then I went into HR and then I ended up making more money. And then I went from working in one organization to being a learning and development person. And I took a pay cut and then I went into it. And so my point being is sometimes by not making money the forefront, I was able to find myself in opportunities that gave me experiences that actually helped me move forward uh, beyond that. And so money is important insofar as that it's a tool to allow us to do certain things, but it is never an end. And at the moment that we realize that, then this whole thing opens up around life because now you're appreciating the experiences that you have, the people you have the opportunity to interact with the things you get to see, the places you go, the smells that you're able to smell, the taste that you're able to taste. And there's a richness to life that goes way beyond money. Am I saying money is not important? No, but it's not the end. Money is the tool. The experiences are the end. Number 13, only put money in places that work for me. A lot of people that don't have faith in some of our financial systems and, and so on. And I'm not here to litigate that, but I am here to say that what I do is I, any money that I have, I always try to put it in a place where it's going to work for me. Now, sometimes when you spend money on something, the value is that you feel good. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that because that's doing something for you. My wife and I always have the running joke that if somebody were to break into our house, they would be mad because they wouldn't find anything because we don't keep cash in our house. We put money, all of the money that we have, to places where it's going to work for us. Uh, it, it doesn't sit in under a mattress. It doesn't sit in a safe in the house. In fact, one of the things that a lot of people don't know is that one of the ways that you hedge against inflation is by investing your money. Because all inflation is, is the increase of cost of goods and services. But if goods and services are going up, who do you think is benefiting from that? The companies. And so the value of the companies goes up. And guess what? Now what you end up having is you end up having higher value stocks because stocks are directly tied to the value of organizations, which is interesting because I know last year, a couple of years ago, we had historic inflation. But then if you look at the stock market, the stock market's done three times what the rate of inflation was. So if you put your money away, then you hedge against inflation. If you put your money in a mattress, then you're talking about the cost of bread and cheese. I, I've always gotten to the habit from a very young age of putting money in places where it's going to work for me. Number 14, figure out where you want to go in life and do something about it. I've, I've always been very clear about what I want to do, and I, I'm still clear. I left my last job. My boss said something about, uh, what are you going to do now? And I said, I'm not going to be coming in here every day, I'm the, but the work isn't done. Uh, because my job is to uplift the human condition in any way that I can. I'm just not going to do it here under these conditions. And uh, he just kind of looked at me. But the fact of the matter is, I know that I want to help people. I know that I want to make the world a little bit better. And through the course of my career, every single job that I've had has directly been related to trying to help make the world a little bit better uh, for the people that live in it, for all of us. Um, and even once I retired, I started doing some substitute teaching. I'm going to be doing some master gardener work where I go into communities and help people grow their own food. Um, I'm doing this YouTube channel as a way to perhaps help and inspire people with information that gets them to the place they want to be a little bit sooner. But it's always about 
what I want to do and I've dedicate myself to it. And I, I figure I'm not going to be able to do everything, but the, you're going to start somewhere and do something. And so as I start one thing and I do one thing, it starts to become a steamroll. And, and you may not know exactly what it is that you want to do, but take some time and think about it. What's the story? Go back to ask yourself the question. When I'm 90 years old, what's the story I want to tell? What do I want to say? What do I, what do I want to be? And start thinking, okay, what can I do today to take me there? And it might be a baby step. It might be a baby step. You know, you want to help people. Well, you know, maybe I can go work at a blood drive. And I worked at a blood drive. Then it was going to the elementary school. Then it was working at an elementary school when I graduated. Then it was going into recruiting to help people get jobs that maybe would have been overlooked under certain situ circumstances. And then it went into HR, making sure that I was use my activism or my platform to, to perpetuate my activism to ensure there's equity across the workforce for all people. Uh, and then it became a matter of helping people understand how to lead others in a way that helps you, helps them build, uh, meet their own needs while helping others meet their needs at the same time. Uh, then it went to running department, uh, making sure that negotiating labor contracts to make sure that labor contracts were equitable and took into account, not just the needs of the organization, but the needs of the people. And I did that on the company side. And then it went to leading HR organizations to ensure that all our practices, programs, and policies were aligned with the kind of world that I wanted to live in. And so in everything that I've done, I've always inserted myself. My wife would tell me that I tend to make job, any job that I had, I made it my own. And I did because I would use whatever was given to me and whatever my charter was to make sure that it was executed in a way that was fair and equitable and helped everybody and moved everybody uh, forward and provided opportunities to everybody. Number 15, and this is the last one, is once you figure out what it is that you want to do, where is it that you want to go, what's the path? And so determine your path and dedicate yourself to it. Sometimes we get caught into the idea that we have to be what others want us to be. But I, I truly believe that everybody has a genius level type of talent. I think everybody is an expert at something. I think everybody has something about them that makes them great. I think most people don't take the time to try to figure out what that is. But once you figure out what that is, build your world around that. Um, I always make the joke that somebody's making billions of dollars because of the idea that people didn't want to take out their own trash. They dedicated their life to it. Now they're billionaires. Anything that you do, if you dedicate yourself to it, mine was to help people uplift the human condition. And so helping people, I was able to get myself to retire at 51 years old and find financial independence. And if somebody would have asked me 30 years ago, well, how are you going to, how is helping people going to work out for you? I didn't know. So the thing is, is you don't have to have all the questions, but no, try to figure out what it is that you want to do. What's your path? And then just go after it as, as they say, get after it. So those are the 15 habits that I had that carried me through the course of my life and my career and got me to the place where I was financially independent and able to retire at 51. I don't know that everybody's going to do all of these things, but I'm sure a lot of us are doing some of the same, some of those things. Now, the more intentional you are about the life that you want to lead, the better off you're going to be. Um, I would ask you that if there are people that you think could benefit from any of this information, please share this channel with them, have them watch what we're doing. Because I, I think what we have here, it's tell my friends that it's not a YouTube channel. It's a movement. It's um, about getting people to feel good enough about what they want to do and validate what it is they want to do. Because the reality, when you say you want to do something, most of the world around you tells you why you can't do it. And I always make the joke, I'm a black man in America that was able to find financial independence and retire at 51. So if I can do it, then, you know, with the little stick to itness, we can all get to the places that it is that we want to be. We just have to want them bad enough and be able to make those sacrifices. And so if you know anybody else that that would resonate with, please share the channel. And if you're watching this uh, and you're not subscribed, help us out and subscribe to the channel. It's um, 
about 500 subscribers. I'm trying to get to 1,000 by the end of the year. I think that is just a goal that I have. And I bring content to you uh, twice a week, uh, Wednesdays and Saturdays. Uh, and I try to bring content that makes sense. And if there's something that you would like to, to have discussed or that you would like to discuss, uh, feel free to put it in the comments. Uh, you'd be surprised at how many topics that we've covered on this channel came from the comments, came from people like you. And the other thing I'd like to know, and please let me know if um, how you feel about this. I've been thinking about doing a live and I'm, I'm a bit intimidated about doing a live episode because I just don't know if that's of interest to you because the channel's not about me, the channel's about you. So I'm thinking about doing a live episode. So let me know if you'd be interested in a live episode and let me know if there's any topics that you would like to have discussed in a, in a live episode. So that way we can maybe have a more direct ongoing conversation. So, but anyway, on that note, I'm going to go ahead and let you go. I know it was a lot of information, uh, I'd like to, I, I know you could have been anywhere else in the world right now and you're here with me and I appreciate that. So, so again, like, subscribe, share, and let me know if you'd like to have a live and have a good rest of your day and I will talk to you soon.